glad uh, that Janusz uh, Markowski agreed to, to speak at this seminar and deliver this uh, talk on the Specker, Specker Blatter theorem. Uh, welcome and please begin. Okay, nice to see you and meet you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. This is a talk I gave in February in, uh, in Zurich at a conference to commemorate Specker's 100th birthday. <clears throat> and uh, well, this is how it goes. I didn't change the slides in then. So the Specker theorem states that the number of labeled graphs over n vertices satisfying a monadic second order definable property satisfies the linear modular recurrence relation over every modulus m. Uh, well, I will give you an explanation for all of this and also some additional <clears throat> developments. Now here is a picture of Specker and the picture of Christian Blatter. And the paper appeared four times without being really noticed. Once in Brussels in a seminar, once as an abstract in the notices, in the old notices, once at a conference uh, in Germany, and finally by Specker alone in a volume which has two more papers which are very well cited and this one again was overlooked. There is actually a lesson to learn here about how to choose your, your publication and also that it is important that you go around at conferences and say, I've proven this, I've proven this. Neither Specker nor Blatter did uh, run around announcing the results besides those publications. Now at this conference on Specker, uh, I checked the uh, most cited paper by Specker with over 3,000 citations is his paper about quantum mechanics and logic. And I'm going to talk about his least cited paper, <laughs> uh, which uh, before I started working on it had less than 10 citations for all versions together. Now the topic is modular recurrence relations or, or, or uh, periodicity uh, for combinatorial counting functions. And it's a topic which is in particular cases very fashionable and covers uh, many pages in the two monographs analytic combinatorics by Flajolet and uh, Sedgwick and by the just very recently published book by Ishvan Meze but uh, neither of the books mentions Specker's uh, theorem. Now congruences for combinatorial functions do appear and actually also by Philip Flajoli and Ira Gessel already in 1980. Ira Gessel has a paper congruences for Bell and tangent numbers and Flajoli has a more general paper on congruences and continued fractions for some classical combinatorial quantities. Uh, but they are, they appear, and also in Mesa's book, they appear one by one. So there is a chapter on Bell and tangent numbers. There is a chapter on Stirling numbers and harmonic numbers and our Fubini numbers, and you can go on, but there is not a single general theorem of the type if the, if the combinatorial function satisfies certain uh, algebraic or definability properties, then something in general happens. Now, uh, uh, what, what Specker and Blatter really study is, is the following. Let P any graph property, no logic involved so far, and let dp the density function for this property as the function of n which counts the number of binary relation over the set N as a set, such that the structure consisting of the universe N and the binary relation P gives us a, a graph or in general, a binary relation with one binary, a structure with one binary relation, which satisfies P. 
And uh, so we count the number of ways you can do this. And uh, dPn is called the density function of P. And if the property happens to be monotone or hereditary, it is called the speed of P, which is a notation which was introduced by, by I think, by Bolobash. And there is an early paper, but only in 94, by Scheinerman and Zito, who initiate a study of growth rates of density functions for hereditary properties and relate them to structural properties of graphs. Speaker's paper is in 1980, and they study, uh, without knowing the, the name, they study actually the density function with, uh, of properties with certain algebraic or definability properties. <clears throat> So how did it all start for Specker and Blatter? Well, Specker was teaching uh, regularly, irregularly also the course introduction to topology and he gives homework. So he defined let Tn be the number of topologies on a set which consists of the elements one to n. Now T1 equals one as the underlying set is always open T2 equals four, for each singleton we can decide whether it is open or not. And for Tn is bounded by two to the two to the n, hence T5 would be smaller than two to the 32. So he gave uh, homework uh, to, to check for T equals five. And uh, a student before Google research and everything, went to the library using the old search techniques of uh, decimal classification and library cards. And uh, I don't know, most people who are uh, much younger than me won't even know those methodologies. And he found, he found two papers. He found a paper that said that T5 equals 7,181 by somebody called A. Shafat on the number of topologies definable for a finite uh, for set so in the Australian Mathematical Society Journal. And he found another paper, T5 equals 6,942 by Evans, Harari, and Lin on the computer enumeration of finite topologies in the communications of the ACM. Now, if you find such uh, two results, then you have all kinds of, of ways of, of uh, associating with them a certain degree of trust. And in the case of Evans, Harari, and Lin, uh, who are known people, and Shafat, who is unknown people, you would gamble, or at least I would uh, give a higher probability for the second result being uh, less likely to be false. Anyhow, the speaker wanted to show at least one of them being false. And he developed a method where he could check that 7,181 modulo two, modulo five is not equals two, whereas 6,942 equals two modulo five happens to be the case. And from the analysis, which we will uh, study now, it will turn out that the first result is not possible and the second one might be true. Actually, the paper claims it was done by computer enumeration. I don't know whether everybody uh, checked this or, or anything. But anyhow, this was the met methodology, the, the problem which gave rise to this. And why, why Speaker and Blatter? Blatter was more regularly teaching the topology course and they discussed it together and uh, finally came to the solution. Why Specker Blatter theorem? Because actually Blatter keeps apologizing that he was only the sparing partner. All the work was done uh, by Specker, but obviously the one who is kicking out all the false attempts also has a merit. So I assume this is uh, too modest. Anyhow, so how do we get into logic? Well, the class of finite topologies is not definable in first order or even second order logic. However, the number of topologies on n points happens to be the same as the number of reflexive transitive relations on n points. Now, but the second thing, 
to be a reflexive transitive relation is first order definable. So actually we can look at the problem where the property P uh, or what we are counting is first order definable and is a property of a binary relation, not of graphs, but of a binary relation. <clears throat> so Specker thought that counting first order definable relations should be amenable using techniques from logic. So here is now the original uh, theorem by Specker and Blatter as it was stated in 1980. Let P be a property of structures A is universe A, finite structures, and binary relations Ri, where each Ri is unary or binary, and P is definable using monadic second order logic. And let dp be the density function for p and dpm the sequence of the density function modulo m. And the theorem now states that dpm of i as a function of i modulo m is ultimately periodic. It was left open when they published the paper whether the restriction uh, to binary or unary relation is necessary. And it was also left open, but even not stated as open, whether the restriction to monadic second order logic was uh, necessary. Uh, they give an example of something which is not definable and indeed doesn't, doesn't have the modularity property, but uh, they don't uh, say much more about this. Now, to understand to understand how dramatic this theorem really is, we should have a look at a classical theorem which is called Redfield's theorem from 1927. Redfield was a brilliant mathematician who worked in a patent office like Einstein or something similar and uh, did some important uh, work and it was rediscovered by Polya and Reed in, uh, in the 50s. Now let reg R be the class of simple regular graphs where every vertex has degree R. And you note that if you fix R, this is a first order definable property. So counting the number of labeled regular graphs, finite graphs, is treated completely in chapter seven of the book Harari and Palmer, graphical enumeration which uh, of the 70s, which was reprinted in 2014, and I highly recommend it as a source for, uh, for, for results of this type. Now they give uh, an explicit formula, which actually goes back to Redfield. And the formula looks like, uh, like the blue thing here below. For cubic graphs, for regular graphs of degree three, the function is explicitly given and it's zero if uh, the number of vertices is odd and it is uh, this horrible expression when the number of vertices is even. Now, uh, here is an ironic question. Can you see that this is ultimately periodic modulo 17? Obviously not, but actually I'm not even sure you can see that this is an integer. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, but anyhow, the Specker theorem claims that you don't have to read this formula. You can be assured that this function should be an integer when it is ultimately periodic modulo 17. However, the, 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 the length of the periodicity can be very long. It is not even estimated in the original paper by Specker. Now, regular graphs of even degree are uh, not monadic second order definable uh, and neither are Eulerian graphs, but Eulerian graphs are connected and regular graphs of even degree. So here is a question. Could you say something similar about Eulerian graphs? And you can. Let CMSOL, it's a logic which wasn't uh, studied or even mentioned in the Specker's time, is the logic obtained from monadic second order logic by adding modular counting quantifiers. So the quantifier CMN 
x phi of x says that the number of elements satisfying phi of x in a finite structure has size a modulo m. Ah, this is a name, sorry. Regular graphs of even degree and Eulerian graphs are therefore CMSL definable because we now say that the degree is uh, is even, which we can say using this quantifier and some logic. And uh, so here is a here is a case which would be covered if we can extend the theorem to CMSOL. And this is not a special case of the Specker Blatter theorem. Now, the example which Specker and Blatter give to, to see the limits of this is uh, something I denote now by EQ2, is the class of finite graphs which consists of the disjoint unions of two equal sized cliques. Now, it can be shown that this is not even CMSOL definable. But it is second order definable. You just say there are two sets which are cliques and there is a bijection between the cliques. But this is not monadic. This is a, you have to quantify over a binary relation. Now, if you look at the density function of this property, we get that uh, uh, at n, you get zero if it is odd and you get for even uh, half of 2m choose m. And the factor half is here because we cannot distinguish the choice of the first click from the choice of its complement, of the, of its, uh, of the second click. Uh, now, they cite in their paper a theorem by Lucas from 1878, which says that for every n, which is not the power of two, we have that this density function modulo two equals zero, and for every n which is not a power, which is sorry, is not a power of two, it is zero, and if it is of power of two, we have it equals one modulo two. Now, I did some research about this theorem, and it wasn't published at the time, so it's uh, found in the archives of the French Academy of Science or somewhere. But I found that in the Graham Knut Patashnik book, it appears as exercise 561. So they, they have uh, found it and seemingly solved the exercise. Now, Specker 20 years ago was 80 and alive and kicking. And I was uh, involved in organizing uh, his 80th birthday conference. And I thought I will give him a birthday gift that I would talk about this theorem and also uh, possibly uh, solve an uh, open problem. Well, I spoke with him about it, but he was very skeptical and laughed at me and said, I'm sure you cannot do it. Well, indeed he was uh, right kind of, and I was anyhow late. <clears throat> but from 2000 on, I started to lecture about this theorem and uh, I, I in seminars and I told everybody everything I knew about it and where I was stuck. And in 2002, we had a young faculty member joining the Technion, Eldar Fisher, and he attended my lecture. And two days later, he came back. Well, knowing everything I told him about it, he came back with a theorem. There is a property of finite structure with one quaternary relation, which is even first order definable but violates the specker blatter theorem. Uh, this was published uh, in the Journal of Combinatorial Theory, Series A in 2003. Now Specker got very, ex we, we obviously we wrote immediately to Specker. He was very excited about it. He wrote another, he wrote another paper, Modular Counting and Substitution of Structures, published in in Nordic's probability and computing in 2005. And Eldar Fischer and later my PhD student, Tomer Kotek and I analyzed the proof of the Blatter-Specker theorem uh, in detail and try to see where we can push the boundaries. So <clears throat> we published a version, the Specker-Blatter theorem revisited in 2003. 
and we published uh, together with uh, Tom Kotek and uh, Elder Fisher actually uh, a chapter. No, sorry, this is uh, this is uh, all without Elder. We published a paper definability of combinatorial functions and the linear recurrence relations, and uh, here they are: Elder Fisher and Tom Kotek. And finally, we published in 2011 a long chapter in the book Model Theoretic Methods in Finite Combinatorics, the title Application of Logic and Combinatorial Se two, log two Combinatorial Sequences and Their Recurrence Relations. Now, one of the first things I did when I prepared now the lecture was I wanted to separate, I wanted to separate uh, the logic from the combinatorics. Uh, because the way it goes with Speaker and Platter is they define some notion of a rank of a property, which they call a substitution. They could not call it rank, they call it index, but substitution rank with values in natural numbers or infinity. And then you can divide their theorem in if P is a monadic second order definable property, then it's substitution rank is finite and what what uh, what i proved with eldar fisher was that if you take the extended logic counting monadic second order logic then still this proposition happens to be true the rest uh, of the proof of specker and platter has nothing to do with logic so you can separate this you want to have a property has to have a finite rank and you give a sufficient condition by definability, which we extended. And then the last part of the theorem says, if P is a property of structures with all relations at most binary and P has finite substitution rank, then the density function modulo M is ultimately periodic for every M. So this now does cover the case of Eulerian graphs and it covers the case of regular graphs of even degree. So next, I'm going to refine a bit the analysis of the Becker-Blatter theorem. And we take into account two additional uh, notions. One is we define the maximal degree of structures in P now, in case of graphs, this is nothing new. This is just the degree of graphs, of, of edges, uh, of vertices of graphs. But in general, we'll have to define it using a trick by one. And then we generalize the substitution rank of a property P using Hunkel matrices, which is a thing which was introduced I'll, I'll give you a short uh, history, but became into prominence only by Lovas works uh, on graph limits recently. So what is the relation of bounded degrees? Assume you have a 17 area relation over a finite set and you want to define a degree of, uh, of a vertex. Now you define a Geifman graph, which has as a universe, uh, uh, the same universe as before, and you define the relation E over A as follows, two vertices or two elements in A are connected if there exists one of the relations in the vocabulary and some tuple such that the tuple satisfies the relation in this structure and both A and B are components coordinates of this tuple. <clears throat> so now you have associated with any, with any uh, relation uh, a graph. And if you have several relations, then you have uh, graphs with several uh, edges, but you can now say the degree of a structure is the maximum uh, degree of elements in the Gaffman graphs of each relation. So we can say a structure is of bounded degree if every element has degree at most E. Okay? 
And we say similarly, a structure is connected if its Geifman graph is connected or all its Geifman graphs are connected. For a class of structures P, we say that uh, the class is of bounded degree or are connected if all its elements uh, are, are connected or of bounded degree. So now we can, we can make additional statements. Let P be a property of tau structures, which is C MSOL definable, and let DPN be its density function. If P is of bounded degree, the function DP satisfies the modular recurrence relation for every M, irrespective of the arity of the relations. Furthermore, if additionally all the models in P are connected, the function FP satisfies a trivial recurrence relations for every M. What is a trivial recurrence relation model N? That ultimately it, it becomes zero. So we don't allow function symbols in our vocabularies, but now we have a case where there is no restriction on the arid. And you can see that the counterexample Specker had in mind with the cliques, the two cliques of equal size, the degree is obviously uh, unbounded in the, in, the, in the class of graphs. Now, the next notion is the notion of a Hunkel matrix, which is associated with a graph property, or in general with a graph parameter, but for here, we only need a special case of a property. Now we introduce the notion of a K graph of order N is a graph with K distinguished elements, uh, A1 to AK. Sometimes people call these ports or something because we want to connect them. And by the way, Hunkel matrices are also called connection matrices. So let box be a binary, any binary operation on graphs. So box could be, for our purpose, it could be obviously anything you, you imagine, but for our purpose, we think of the disjoint union of two graphs. We can think of the K union, which is the disjoint union of, of two K graphs, and then identifying the corresponding ports, A1 with A1, uh, A2 with A2, and so on. Or it could be the substitution uh, of G H if for a point in G. So you take a point in G, a distinguished point, and you blow it up into a set, which is, is a graph H. And every point in the original graph, which was connected to this specific point, is now connected to every point in H. And every point which was not connected is not connected to any point in H. So this is kind of the substitution of a graph into another graph. So these are the three, or there will be one more, the, the join of two graphs uh, uh, operations which interest us, but the definitions are much more general. So you start now, you want to build, or, or, or I induce you to build, <coughs> A, uh, a infinite matrix where rows and columns are labeled by finite graphs or by finite labeled graphs, uh, the, depending on what we need. So GI is an enumeration, enumeration of all finite K graphs. If you want up to isomorphism, but it doesn't matter. Uh, let P be a graph property. And now we define a zero one matrix, H, Hunkel, P, for this operation box, where the entry at ij is one if, uh, at row i and j, if g i box g j happens to satisfy property p, and we put zero otherwise. And we denote by rk p box the rank of this matrix over the field of two elements. This is a uh, log index, it should be below. And the matrix obtained like this is called the Hunkel matrix of P, 
for uh, of p and box for k graphs. Unknowingly, Platter and Speaker actually use a special case of the Hankel matrix. Now, if you Google Hankel matrices, you find many, 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 many papers in in numeric analysis in in. Uh, uh, probability theory, coding theory, and in combinatorial enumeration. Uh, but uh, the, this is always the case where the value of the of the, the entries of the matrix happen to be elements of a field or the reals mostly or something similar. But but uh, so these are and f are any function over a field f. Little f is a function over a field. Big F. Now, Hunkel matrices over words were introduced in the following way. Now, you ask yourself, well, in the sorry, in the case of numeric analysis, the operation is plus. In the case of Hunkel matrices over words, you have to think what replaces plus, and you take concatenation. And find that there is a Hankel matrix over words with an application in stochastic automata by Carlyle and Pass in 1971. They give the characterization in terms of uh, probability function is acceptable by a stochastic automata if and only if its uh, its uh, Hankel matrix has finite rank. This was uh, forgotten and then it was uh, resurrected and it appears in a paper on learning, exact learning theory by uh, Baimel, Bergadano, Pshuti, Kushilevitz, Varikyo and on China. And it also appears again in, in picture languages in formal uh, two dimensional set of words, two dimensional words in a paper by Mats and Giamarezi and later by Restivo. Now, to be precise now, the Carla El Paz theorem goes like this. A multiplicity automaton A of size R is given by a set of uh, functions of matrices R times R matrices over F, two vectors lambda and gamma uh, in f uh, of r and you define a function f of a by iterating uh, concatenation along uh, and for each iteration you multiply with uh, matrix and lambda and gamma are initial and final uh, vectors and then you can say a function f is representable as a function of a multiplicity automata, if and only if the Hankel matrix has finite rank. So this is a, this is the first uh, paradigm of using uh, the finite rank of Hankel matrices to to get something out of it. So here F uh, is what? In the case of multiplicity uh, automata? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You take any matrix over F. So F is a space where uh, if it's probabilities, it's the reals. If it is uh, mm -hmm. any field uh, or, or something. Any field or, or uh, mm -hmm. and the matrices are sometimes stochastic, doubly stochastic, then it's called probabilities and otherwise it's just any field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So for graphs, uh, what plays the role of concatenation? Well, you can use disjoint union. And indeed, it appears in Friedman, Lovas, and Schreiber's 2003 paper to characterize multiplicative graph parameters over the real numbers. You can use K unions, as I defined before. They are called connections, and then they are called connection matrices. And they are used by Friedman, Lovas, Schreiber, and Segedi. Yes, uh, for characterizing various forms of partition functions. And uh, you can use joins, Cartesian products, generalized sum-like operations, and so on. 
to prove non-definability of certain properties, which was used by, uh, was discovered by us when we were reading these papers. Uh, Kotlin was a PhD student at Technion, not mine, and Tomer Kotlin was my student. And we figured out uh, these new applications. So given a binary operation of graphs and the property P say of graphs now, or arbitrary structures where relations and functions are, are allowed and no restrictions on the number of arguments. The property P of such structures, we say that P has a box rank uh, infinite or a fixed number if the corresponding Hankel matrix over the field of characteristic two has uh, the corresponding rank. Now we also say if you, because we want to deal with several logics, we want to say something about monadic second order logic or other fragments of, uh, of uh, second order logic. In particular, we think now first order monadic second order or counting monadic second order logic, but you can think of others. What is important, we need a notion of quantifier rank. So if your logic has an acceptable notion of quantifier rank, then we can say that uh, uh, two graphs or two structures are L logic and Q the number equivalent. If they satisfy the same sentences of quantifier rank Q, and we say that the box operation is L smooth if whenever two pairs of structures are, uh, uh, cannot be distinguished by, by sentences of quantifier and Q, then also the applying the operation pairwise gives two structures which cannot be distinguished by quantifier rank Q. Now, how to prove that an operation box is smooth. Well, in first order and monadic second order logic, it is done using Erfoy Fry C games, also known as Pebble games. <clears throat> the first, the case of monadic second order was first proved by Hans Leukley in 66. Another way of establishing smoothness is via generalizations of the Pfefferman Watt theorem, which I studied in. Uh, paper in honor of Tusky's 100th birthday. And in this case, we need, I say here two, but actually three cases, the disjoint union, the substitution, and the join of graphs. And then we find out that both the disjoint union, the substitution, and the join are CMSOL smooth. And then we can formulate the finite rank theorem. Let F be a numeric graph parameter, graph paramonium, polynomial graph property is a special case where the parameter takes values zero or one. Uh, let F be a numeric graph parameter definable in L and taking values in an integral domain R and let box be a smooth operation then the connection matrix has finite rank over R. And the proof uses a pfefferman watt type theorem for graph polynomials, which was developed in my work with Bruno Cursell and uh, Woody Rotich uh, around 2000. Platter and Specker prove it for substitution rank and Lobas proves it for partition function. So there are many, many applications of this finite rank theorem. But what we find out here is that if P is a property of structures over some fixed vocabulary and P has finite disjoint union rank and all its members are bounded degree D, then uh, the density function modulo M is ultimately periodic. And further, furthermore, if the structures are connected, then it is trivially ultimately periodic. Uh, for the example before, we have seen that the bounded degree cannot be dropped, even in this case. For structures of unbounded degree, one needs a stronger assumption, namely the finiteness of the substitution rank.
Now, again, there is some history which uh, people didn't know of each other, the actors of this. So we can look at the disjoint union rank of P and find out that early work by Ira Gessel actually deals with this. A class of structures P is, a, I call it a Gessel class, if for every A and B, the disjoint union of B is in P if and only if both of the components are in, in P. The class of forests is a Gessel class. If P is hereditary and closed under disjoint union, it is a Gessel class. Every Gessel class has a disjoint union rank at most two. If P is a class of connected graphs, P has this disjoint union rank at most two, but it, but it is not a Gessel class. And if P1 and P2 have finite disjoint union rank, so do uh, P1 union P2, P1 intersection P2 and the complement. So Gessel in 84 actually proved a kind of a forefather, though it paper was published later, of the specker blatter theorem, which goes like this. If C is a Gessel class of directed graphs of degree at most D, then the density function of M plus N equals the density function of M times DCN modulo M over L, where L is the least common multiple of all divisors of M not greater than D. Well, I don't want you to understand this. I just want to show you that indeed somebody had had an idea of looking at, at such a property. So in particular, we get that uh, the, the, the density function N satisfies the recurrence relation, which fits now the framework of uh, Specker and Platte. DC of N equals A uh, to the M times DC of N minus D factorial M modulo M, where A is this to the M is DC of uh, <coughs> uh, D factorial M. Now, you see there are only countably many uh, definable properties because uh, of the way they are represented. But how many classes are there of finite disjoint union rank? And when we discussed it with Speker, he gave a hint how to do this. And actually one can prove there are continuum many Gessel classes. There are continuum many properties of structures with disjoint union rank two. And there are continuum many properties of structures with finite substitution rank. So this really shows that when we separate the logic part of the specker blatter theorem and the combinatorial part of the specker blatter theorem, then we see that uh, the sufficient condition to get finite rank is very attractive, but it doesn't cover uh, uh, too many cases. Now I'm getting slowly to the end. <clears throat> Now, here is an observation. Uh, we want to see what is the relation between this joint union rank and substitution rank. And for this, we also introduced the join of two graphs. So it's a disjoint union and everybody on one side is connected to everybody on the other side. And let P be a graph property. Then we have that the rank of P for this joint union is smaller equal to substitution rank and the rank of the join is also smaller or equal to the substitution rank. And it turns out that the class of Hamiltonian graphs is connected and hence has rank two. However, Ham has infinite rank, hence also infinite substitution rank. So this leaves us with a, with a problem because uh, the, the have Hamiltonian graphs of fixed degree or, or of bounded degree are covered by the theorems, but Hamiltonian graphs of uh, arbitrary degree are not covered and we are actually left open. What can we say about the counting function, the density function for Hamiltonian graphs modulo M? 
Now here is a last remark on complexity. Let H be possibly infinite set of finite graphs. Let F sub of H and be the class of graphs where which has no subgraph isomorphic to member of H and F int the same for induced subgraphs and F minor for minors. If H is finite, they all have finite substitution rank because they are MSOL definable or even first order definable. But in general, we don't know. If H is finite, what is the computational complexity of computing the substitution rank for all those classes. In particular, what is the complexity if H is a singleton, just one forbidden graph? If H is infinite, do F uh, the forbidden subgraphs and forbidden induced subgraphs still have finite rank? So these are all problems which uh, so far I, I didn't solve and uh, and they are open and you are welcome to look at them. Now, there is another touch to this, which comes from graph polynomials. Let f, g, x be a univariate graph polynomial. The graph polynomial is just a graph parameter which takes values in a polynomial ring over a field. So the chromatic polynomial, the independence polynomial, the matching polynomial, the characteristic polynomial, that polynomial and so on and so on. They are all graph polynomials. Now fix your favorite family of graphs GN, uh, like all, uh, all uh, paths or all cliques or whatever you want. And let FM of this graph polynomial of N be the number, be the value of the graph polynomial of GN at input A modulo M. Now, I didn't come up with this crazy idea, but uh, I found a paper where, where this is studied for the case of the TAT polynomial. And so we have a density function for a graph polynomial. And the problem is when is the sequence which we obtain like this ultimately periodic? Uh, well, this is another open problem and I'm working on, on, a, on a paper where we have some partial answers on this. So let me conclude now. There is this paper by Speker Blatter which was widely overlooked and what are its merits? Well, it initiates a systematic study of congruence relations for combinatorial counting functions and before and still now mostly special cases are studied. It anticipates the use of rank of Hankel matrices in combinatorics. In recent work by Lovas and his many collaborators, graph limits and partition functions, this plays a central role. It formulates for the first time a meta theorem before Kursel, before anybody else, connecting definability in monadic second order logic with hardcore uh, combinatorics. Well, this has predecessors like the Buchi Elko Trachtenbrot theorem characterizing regular languages. Uh, and then we have the Coursel theorem and, and uh, variations where I was also involved with, but this is the end, this is 15 years before, before everybody else. Cool. What were our improvements when we started studying this? Well, Eldar Fisher gave the counter example using quaternary relations. The ternary case is still open. Analyzing the counter examples, we noticed the role of bounded degree structures and the role of the uh, disjoint union rank. And proving earlier versions of the finite rank theorem, we extended the Specker Blatter theorem to include Eulerian graphs. Well, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Can you uh, switch on the light on your side? Maybe we will see you better. You are very dark now. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe I will ask the first question and then uh, everybody else is welcome to, uh, to, to ask further questions. So my question would be uh, this one. So what can be said about, so how is um, 
So your, uh, the theorem tells about ultimate periodicity. What can be said about the period that uh, in the periodic sequence? Are there some estimates? What can be the period? Yes. So how constructive is it? Uh, if you prove abstractly, uh, well, the period is related to the rank. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Specker Blatter version, the rank is estimated using the, the finite rank theorem. But the finite rank theorem is very, very, very bad because mm -hmm. it uses, uh, you, you have to estimate the number of, uh, well, you, you take the formula defining the property, you count the number of quantifiers in this, and then you have to count the number of uh, formulas of, of the same quantifier rank and uh, but but this is way too too big I mean uh, you you can uh, as we have seen if the class is of graphs is connected and the rank is always two mm -hmm. so the but I, I didn't uh, when I prepared now the lecture I didn't go back to the proof and figure out exactly how the how the rank is related to to the period so this is a open, this is a problem to give to a student, but uh, I don't I didn't have a student for this. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, anyone else uh, questions? Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Um, well, mm -hmm. hello, Janusz. Uh, so um, the, um, you know, looking at these L smooth operations, there seems to be perhaps much more going on there. Like uh, you, you use the, you know, the smoothness of the operations and then the analysis of ranks as uh, Lev was asking just uh, now, but there seems to be maybe more about different logics. Have you, you know, does it make any sense at all to try to, you know, link some more combinatorial properties to maybe other logics, not necessarily, you know, see uh, second order monaic with uh, the additional a quantifier or something else and study the smoothness of these operations or is this something you know completely uh, you know uh, I just um, found it very interesting and uh, I'd like to know if there is more on this smoothness of operations and the connection to this problem yes well, I didn't study other logics but uh, the, the point is <clears throat> I try to study uh, uh, to, to a gen I mean, if you look at the finite rank theorem, it really is an application of a Pfefferman Wood type theorem. Yeah. And then you, yeah, exactly. you're really asking, you are asking for which logics can you prove a Pfefferman Wood type theorem? And right. I tried, well, I have a paper on this, but there is a uh, unfinished uh, claim. Uh, so, so we, we didn't manage to characterize those those logics properly, but I think the the, the main point here is is that the, the connection or Hankel matrices are, are the more interesting ingredient here. So if I now had to give a, or if somebody would ask me, can I do a master or PhD? Then I would say we should study the the relationship between the the rank and the and the periodicity of the ultimate periodicity. Yeah. Yeah. There are many cases where you have finite finite rank and you don't have definability. Hmm. Also That's interesting, interesting cases, not just uncountably many. So uh, I was actually I'm most proud that I've thrown out the logic from from this theorem. But 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 but, but Janusz, uh, having finite rank doesn't, uh, or maybe some game, you know, and for try say game or whatever, doesn't it give you some way of defining maybe some interesting logic, you know, not going from logic to, to combinatorics, but going from the combinatorics to get some kind of logic and then see if it has some interesting properties? Yeah, I, I, I tried this. I, I can give you the reference. It's in Yuri Gurevich's uh, uh, 75th birthday volume. There is, well, if you look, this is Nadia Labai. Look at my archive, it's posted there. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Yeah. Oh. Oh, this is... 
Okay. Yeah, that's so, which is so, first in the quick, quick follow up, uh, Andres. Uh, just Kevin Compton was had had some work around descriptive uh, finite model theory. Uh, which, yeah. which was talking about closure under operations like like disjoint union and 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 some and so on. And so I, I know you told me before. So the Gessel class is up here also in Compton's paper. I know. That. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So well, well, what, what's the question? Well, just I was, I was just I, I, you didn't mention this, and I thought maybe I, I, I just was bringing it up as as another possible source for looking at this. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I write it down because I keep forgetting it, but yes. Uh, I, I do have a, a different question. Um, yes. What's the connection between, uh, if any, between these um, modular uh, results and, and growth rate of the, uh, of, of the function, uh, of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the speed? Uh, well, it's a sequence of paper, and the one I quoted is the first. Of the, I have a longer version of the slides where I list all the papers. So they have a, a study, and they show that not all, in the case of hereditary cases, or also uh, subgraphs, they can classify the speeds. It's either very flat or, or uh, so yeah. five growth yeah. rates, and and. And and the flatter it is, the more structure theory you have. There seems yeah, to yeah, be so an I'm analogy. Sorry. There seems to be an analogy between uh, stability and uh, and. Uh, well, and th speed. there's there's quite there's quite serious work on that in the last couple of years by Carol and Terry and Chris Laskowski, uh, where they use quite heavy model theory to to refine these these classifications. Yes, and that, that's that's why. It, that's why it came to mind. It, but, but is there any, it, it, when you, you said something about trivial recurrence relations, what, what, what did that mean? And did it, did it mean that they died out no, you, in, in the connected case? Let me give you an example. Take the number of orderings on n elements. This yeah. is n factorial. Yeah, right. For every m, this is ultimately zero. Uh -huh. Ah, right. Thank you. And actually, every every trivial thing has is of, is of this form. It it has hidden in it a factor which is the factorial. Uh -huh. Okay. But what is the reference you wanted to give me? A reference? Um, I, I'll send you a note with the. Uh, yeah, but it's Carolyn Terry, who is a postdoc at U at University of Chicago, and Chris Laskowski. There's there's three or four papers at least. This is the best. Yeah. Can you send me an email with the link? Yes, I will. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, glad to see you here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, we're on, we're okay. on three continents at least. Yes. At least, yeah. Okay. Um, any further questions? Uh, uh, hello. Uh, may I ask uh, something also? Uh, uh, I did not uh, completely understand about the very beginning of the of the lecture. How uh, c can we prove that? Uh, give the estimates for for the number of reflexive and transitive relations using this technique. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. So what are you asking? Uh, so uh, how, how can you get this uh, result that, uh, that uh, 7,181 does not fit? First of all, uh, I don't know. I didn't find. This is what Specker claims in his paper. Ah. But I, I didn't see how, how he how he computed because obviously you would have to have an expression for for the for the periodicity. 
yeah here you need to to know that the period is something like uh, yeah you have to to know more than the theorem tells you yes in this yeah. case so the answer is i don't know i i would have to dig in speckers paper whether they have an explanation or not mm -hmm. so you need something else besides periodicity Okay. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. He, he he claims here that in the in the particular case he can uh, he can uh, give some estimate on or some uh, some information about uh, the the sequence. Uh -huh. But I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. You are right. If this was a PhD exam, then it was be unexcusable that I didn't check this. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyone else with the uh, with the questions? No. Uh, I've just a last question. Just wondering, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. Geithman graphs that uh, were used to find the degree. Uh, so you, you start with the structure, and then you build the graph. And it seems to, you know, it seems to, to recognize something about the structure, very, kind of very vague uh, substratum of the, of the structure. Uh, I just wonder what, what else can, can this be used for or has this been used for? This is just, uh, you know, a reflection of my ignorance of this uh, subject, but it's, it looks very interesting. Oh. They, they were used in all kinds of, I mean, the people wanted to generalize the tree width of an arbitrary finite structure or something like this. So then uh, when they have a good theory for graphs, they were looking whether they can do it for structures by using Geifman graphs and say uh, a structure has bounded tree width if it's Geifman graph has bounded tree width and then whether you can still prove corresponding theorems. It's very popular in finite model theory. I think if you take Lipkin's book on, okay. on uh, okay. finite model theory, you find applications. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah or Ebbinghaus and Flume. Mm -hmm. I beg your pardon? Uh, Ebbinghaus and Flume, is, it's also in there. Just, just giving yes, Andres another example. Okay, yes. okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe I will ask yet another question. Uh, so, um, suppose you are in a language which does not, for which you don't have uh, this ultimate periodicity of, of this density function. Uh, what kind of restriction on the, on the sequence would you think uh, one can expect in this case? Like, yeah. Do you expect there will be some meaningful? Do you think there will be some meaningful results, for example, covering uh, the case with your counterexample, uh, where you where you have some growth? Of, uh, you know, but what what do you want to cover? I mean, the the thing from Lucas' theorem is not periodic. So I don't understand your question. Uh, let me try to uh, put it another way. Maybe I'm missing some some point here, but uh, uh, so the theorem essentially says that if uh, uh, if you consider a class of structures definable in some logic uh, under certain conditions, you will have ultimate periodicity of this density function. So the mod modular uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you relax, uh, if you go to a more uh, powerful language, you lose this property. Well, you find properties which, which don't behave like this, yes. Uh, you find properties which don't behave like this, exactly. But they will still behave in a certain, let's say, uh, controlled way. Uh, so what would be the uh, expectation? Are, uh, will these sequences be somehow fu fully uh, 
let's say, difficult to describe, or uh, would there be some some other property that will be observed by uh, by such sequences? You don't have ultimate periodicity. Maybe you will have, uh, for example, uh, the thought that I had in mind was was this. Maybe that's a uh, uh, wrong uh, kind of um, idea, but. Okay, this ultimate periodic sequences are definable in, in let's say, some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, Presburg, things like Pressburger arithmetic or something like this, right? They can't Maybe. be because there are uncountably many like this. There can't be a logical system which characterizes them. Uncountably many of what? There are uncountably many properties which have uh, this joint union, finite this joint union rank. So there is, there is no, no logic which captures them. But I'm not talking about properties uh, that are not within any logic. I'm talking about properties that are definable in some logic which is simply more expressive than the, the logics that you deal with, uh, right? So that's, that was my uh, intention. So, so can we phrase this like this? Uh, I don't understand. So assume the property is definable in second order logic. Yes. And there are some formulas which, which satisfy the the the, the Specker-Blatter theorem, and there are some formulas which do not. And you want to have an exact uh, boundary here instead of counting. No, no, no. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, not exactly. No, no, no. So I wanted to uh, to uh, let's say. Uh, Obviously, we need to weaken. Uh, uh, so the condition of the Specker-Blatter theorem is not is no longer a hold for these for for these uh, properties definable in this in second order uh, language. But um, maybe you can still say something. Uh, uh, you don't expect periodicity, but some other regularity of such of such sequences. Mm -hmm. That was the question. So maybe you can describe some other class which would be regular in some way and still have some information. So extract some weaker information, but from the definability in second order logic. Yeah. That might not be a meaningful question. Maybe it's, uh, uh, but still. I don't know. One has to think about it. Okay, uh, yeah. So, um, I guess- and You uh, see, there is not, there is besides, nobody mm -hmm. has worked on this. If, if, if I manage to get some people to work on those problems, I'll be ha happy to give them more information mm -hmm. with, which I have, but there is, if you now look at, yeah. uh, at the citation index and the, the paper, but it's low, uh, as you told us. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, but then, then we are, we are always, mm -hmm. I mean, my, my papers are the most appear there, and not mm -hmm. much, not much, not much else. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, well, uh, it happens sometimes. I don't, I don't know what, what it tells you that, uh. uh Apparently, that uh, that paper by Specker became very, the, the most cited paper became so famous after quantum computing and all this uh, hype about quantum no, no, information, no, no, no. etc. Et no, no, no. It came. It was already before. Yeah, of of course, it was already well known before, uh, uh, and it was much earlier that that we know. But uh, but so many citations. No, no. no, no also, the citations. You should. You should go to the Zurich site. The slides mm -hmm. of Fröhlich are available and he gives an extra. There are two talks which are posted there, mm -hmm. the slides about Specker's work on quantum mechanics. So you can have a look at it. They give a historical account. Okay. 
Okay, so again, thank you okay. very much. Okay, thank you thank very much. Thank you for this talk, so it was nice to have you here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Goodbye. Thank you for all of you. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. We stop, thank you. We stop our... Mm -hmm. Okay, I leave. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, goodbye. Goodbye, Janusz. Thank you. Bye, Janusz. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay, everyone is saying thanks and leaving. Yes. Mm -hmm.